Hello, 2020 audience. Welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are conversations with creative visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. We're gonna have 20 minutes of conversation with me and the guest, and then we will have 20 minutes of answering questions from you, the global audience, so please write in. We love your questions. Sometimes we can't get to them all, but we do value you writing them in. I am Liz Hinline, creative director and filmmaker, and I'm so proud and pleased to present William Tyler Smith, amazing filmmaker and master educator. Hello, Billy. Hi, how's, how's it going? It's going great. I love, we, Billy and I, I'll just let you guys know, audience, is that we were just having just a fascinating conversation about all things digital versus film. And it's really interesting that you know, I grew up on film and I, and there is something so beautiful and poetic, but I don't know if it's because I just grew up on it that it's beautiful and poetic. Yeah. And I'm looking at that. What do you think? Yeah, I think, I think there, there, there's a lot of truth to that because, um, you know, I, I have a, a strong affiliation or connection to Hollywood in the 1970s. Um, and um, yeah, I think, I think it is, is we do get used to a certain look. Um, you know, as I, as I was just telling you, um, um, it was really difficult. I just switched to, uh, I'm also still a photographer, and I was shooting film until about three years ago. Uh, and I was one of the really adamant, stubborn, no, I'm not going to shoot digital. And then I, um, I was teaching, I was hired to teach at Knife in Mumbai, and I started to think, um, okay, how much is this going to cost, so on and so forth. So I ended up getting a digital camera um, and started shooting digitally. Now, in terms of, um, you know, I also was telling Liz, I had, I had a student, by the way, I love shooting uh, photography digitally now, it's awesome. Um, but I did have a student about <laughs> three years ago, and he said to me, um, Billy, do you, do, do you really prefer film over digital? And it was the first time anyone had ever said anything like that to me, and it took me by surprise because it just seemed so obvious to me, well, of course I love film more, doesn't everybody? Um, but apparently that isn't the case. And I think you're right, Liz. I think it does have to do with what, what we're used to. Um, digital's great. I mean, it, it, there's positive negatives with every, every format. Um, and I, 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 I love the ease of digital. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of positives there. You know? um, tell me about, so tell me about the 70s and the influence for you, because uh, that is such an iconic time period. Um, yes, I, I lived in the 70s. Um, I remember the 70s. I, my father was a cinema buff. Uh, so I basically grew up watching the history of American uh, cinema. Um, and this is a little odd, but <laughs> um, my father used to take me to all the movies in the 70s, The Godfather and The Exorcist. And I was a young kid and I saw all these movies in the theater. Um, now, he, I will clarify, will say this, that um, he did always discuss the content with me, always. Before or after? Before and after, both. Okay. Um, well, you weren't like suddenly surprised with The Exorcist. No. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think maybe that, that has a lot to do with my connection to my father. Um, you know, now that I'm older, I personally, that's my favorite, the 60s, 70s in Hollywood are my favorite. Those are my favorite decades um, in Hollywood. Um, because I think, I think more interesting films were made or more films that I, I enjoy, put it that way. You know? and, and when you're saying interesting film to you, what does that mean? Um, I, I like all kinds of film. Um, I always tell people I like films that are well-directed, intelligent, um, but I generally like films that are more psychological, uh, that deal with human dramas. Um, I, I love E.T., um, but I, I have no interest in making E.T. or directing E.T., and I'm happy that Steven Spielberg did. Uh, I'm not really interested in directing Born Ultimatum or those kind of movies, but I'm, I'm happy they exist and I love them. Um, but they're not really for me. Um, I tend to like European cinema a lot. Um, I'm a big Vin Vendors fan, uh, to be honest. Um, so it, it, I love experimental cinema. Um, I love documentary. I love, I just, I love creation and I love 
interesting creation that has a meaning. Uh, I don't like to just be entertained. I mean, of course, film is entertainment by definition. Anything is entertaining, but mm -hmm. but I, I want to come out of a, of, of a film and I want to feel, wow, that really affected me. And oftentimes, like I'm the kind of, you know, there's certain people, they know every line of dialogue in a movie and they're like these dictionaries. I can't tell you, I don't remember dialogue. I even don't remember ca characters a lot of the time, but I could tell you how a film made me feel and how it affected mm -hmm. And if I left that theater and I'm still thinking about that movie a week later, wow, that, 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 that's an intense movie and that's a really good movie because it impacted me on a level more than just entertainment. So I respect films like that. But what I still, be, do I hate, sorry. I totally get it. I totally get it. What would be like a film, one of the films that inspired you to be a filmmaker? That's an interesting question. I will tell you in 1989, 88, um, I knew that, well, I knew that I, I, I was probably going to go to graduate film school and uh, I saw Wings of Desire. <laughs> and I have to say that that film changed my life. Um, I had never seen a film like it. Um, cinematography was just absolutely stunning. Uh, and the story I, I found really, really interesting and compelling. You know, plus the whole film's an allegory about the reunification of Germany. Um, so it, it's got all these multiple layers in it, and it's a film about being a human being, right? Um, so that film really inspired me. You know, another film that inspired me, I guess a little dated now, but I, subject wise, it's Sex Lies and Videotape, you know? Um, and it was an enormous success, I have to say. <laughs> Um, I really connected with uh, the James Spader character. And I remember watching him in those John Hughes movies. And I remember thinking, this guy's a better actor. He can do, he can do different things. And thank you, Steven Soderbergh, um, for casting him. That movie really inspired me as well. Uh, and then, you know, then, I, went, then I, I was fortunate enough to be accepted at UCLA uh, Graduate Film School. And uh, so I went out to LA um, for eight years. And now I'm back in New York. Um, that was a hard decision because I had gotten into NYU and UCLA grad schools, and I'm from New York, so it was not an easy decision. Um, but and, I, and I, so go ahead, what sorry. Pushed you, what pushed you to the west to the west coast? The, the west is the best, isn't that what Jim Morrison said? No. Um, <laughs> um, I I basically said, well, at that time, I think things are different today. I I thought, well. People say all roads lead to, to LA in the film industry. And if I have an opportunity to go to film school there, why not do it? And, and, and if I wanna stay, I'll stay. Um, and if I don't, I won't stay. I knew New York because I was raised here. Uh, so that's, that's ultimately why I made the decision. I also went out there to visit and the facilities were really good at UCLA, really good. They were better than NYU actually. So that was that that was another reason. And I felt that the students, yeah, basically, that's, that's, that's how I ended up. There. You find there's a difference between like, the New York business, the film business, and the LA film business? Yes. <laughs> Is that a one word uh, answer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those. Yes, yeah, so I, really I, really <laughs> I really want to talk about this. Um, no, it. it um, yes, look, it's. It, it's. I know we talked about this. I. I left Los Angeles. Um, I did get some attention there. I met a lot of producers. Um, I. I just. I'm not a Hollywood guy. I. I again, I'm not anti Hollywood. I love Hollywood movies. I just. I'm not interested. I've always been a very independent spirited person ever since I was a kid. I've always been the kind of, well, if I want to do this, okay, I'll just do it and just learn by doing. Um, I think that the mentality in New York is, is, is more independent, is more um, th than Los Angeles. Los Angeles tends to be more about the big industry. Of course, that's not entirely true. There's a lot of great independent filmmakers there and uh, in an independent scene there. Oh, absolutely. Um, but I, I just felt it wasn't really for me, and I, I know a lot of people who would try to fit into the, um, the mold uh, of you know, trying to be successful in Hollywood, and I, and I said to myself, but I don't want to do that because I know myself, and I think if I were to do that, that would not be good for me to do emotionally. Um, so it wasn't an easy decision to make, you know, um, 
and who knows, had I stayed in Los Angeles, uh, would I have been making different kinds of films? I, I don't know the answer. That's, um, but, but I came back to New York and I, I, I've never regretted it. I never think about Los Angeles. I don't miss it. There's things I miss about it. There's people I miss. I love the nature out there. Out there. PCH1, awesome. Um, you should all take that drive from LA to San Francisco. Um, go to the desert, <laughs> Joshua Tree. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm more of a, I'm more of a New York person, basically. And know. do you find that, because I love what you're saying about knowing yourself, do you find that through making your art, you get to know yourself better? Of course. Absolutely. I think, you know, people always say, oh, your films aren't therapy. Well, they kind of are. I think all of your, any artist will say, well, well of course, any artwork I do is Inform and it informs me about myself, and then I'm, I'm always going to learn something about myself. I, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, sometimes it's positive things, sometimes maybe not. Not, but but either way, whether you discover negative things about yourself, that's positive because now you have an awareness of it, right? Um, so yes, I don't see how you can if 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 you're creating if your creation is coming from here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it's not being changed by outside forces and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Of course, you're going to learn about yourself. That's why I love and doing that. <laughs> what's one of the projects that you learn the most on? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, learned in terms of filmmaking? What could be the, your, your craft or about yourself or about working with humans? Because that's always a learning curve. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say every, everything I've done, I've learned different things from, um, but I would say that the, the documentary that I did about Summerhill School, Summerhill School in England, um, which I shot over five years, um, so I, I, I spent, um, you know, I was embedded, <laughs> I guess, at the school, so I spent a lot of time, um, with children, um, in an, in an alternative educational environment, uh, that I, I had, I did, I had a lot of support for, but I think after spending all that time with the children and seeing their development over time, um, yeah, I think I really, it really solidified for me. I've always been into alternative ideas. Um, and I think that, yeah, that really, I, I really did learn something about myself that yeah, I really, I really am interested in this. I really do support this philosophy. There really is something here. Um, in terms of, you know, I, the film that I've been shooting recently, well, that we just completed fin uh, shooting about the Flaming Groovies, completely different. I mean, this is, this is a rock and roll world. <laughs> and um, that has a lot of ups and downs. And, you know, I, I think when you make docs, when you're dealing with people, you have to learn about yourself and you, because you're always reacting, it's reactive filmmaking. And um, uh, it's always difficult because you're dealing with people and in unpredictable situations. Um, so you're always learning about yourself, always, you know. So how, like say with, with your school documentary, how did that come about that you chose that? Because that's investing five years of your life. I didn't know it was gonna be five years. <laughs> um, I, well, that's a cool story. That, yeah, that's a cool story. I was in LA uh, and I went to the Bodhi bookstore. I don't know if it still exists, um, but it's kind of a new agey uh, bookstore. And, um, you know, I'm the kind of person that uh, I go to the education section <laughs> in a bookstore. I'm like one of those nerds, you know, psychology section, the sociology section. So um, I had read Summerhill when I went, I was at Tufts University as a freshman, uh, as a the undergrad. And I, I read the book there in an English class. And I went, wow, this is fascinating school. And so when I was at the Bodhi uh, bookstore, years later, at LA, I saw Summerhill on the on the shelf, the book. And I said, interesting. I pulled it out. I didn't, I didn't have my old copy in LA. I bought it. I said, you know what, I want to read it. Because sometimes when you you believe something and then later, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, you're going, why was it, what, what was I thinking? Um, I read the book and I felt even more strongly about it. I was just about, I was just about to graduate. I didn't even know the school had still existed. And I said to a friend of mine who I went to UCLA with British, 
and we had talked about working together as DP. Um, I said, hey man, would you be interested in maybe doing a film about this school? I sent a fax to the owner, um, mm -hmm. spoke to her. She was very positive. It was really simple. Um, I had a little bit of money, and this was done completely. I'll tell you, there were moments when I was shooting that film where I had $300 in my, I'm, it's crazy. I had $300 in my bank account. I'm in England. I have a crew of four, and I have to put them in B&Bs and feed them. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, so it really was that simple. Once we started shooting, um, it was a good fit. And we all, everyone got along. The owners, they, they, they liked us. And so we ended up shooting for five years and following certain children. Um, I'm hoping to do a follow-up this year because it's the 100th anniversary of the school. And those children now are in their 30s, and some of them have children. Um, so I do want to do a follow-up. As you were saying, like the Michael Aptit, you know, um, this would be 20 up, 20 years later. <laughs> but, but it'd be cool, you know. That'd be super cool. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And we were talking about, and obviously you're also known as a, like a master teacher, educator. I don't know. What, what, what about, what of teaching has informed your filmmaking? Or what's the, the um, overlap that happens? I tell you what, I, I, here's a little known secret about being a teacher, I think. I like the teaching environment because I, I learn a lot from students and it has to, I, have to, I have to keep my mind active. Um, so it, it, it keeps me always thinking and I'm constantly stimulated. Um, I have to be on my toes. So um, I love it. I really love it. I, you know, before I started teaching, I was doing reality for a couple of years and I loved it. I, I really did. There was a lot of really positives about it. But um, I, I, the way that I think about film, I, I guess people, some people think I'm too serious about it. Um, but um, yeah, that, I don't know if I've answered it. <laughs> you know, one thing we talked about um, before was we were talking about how you look at, and I like this uh, analogy a lot, because being a teacher is like being a coach. Yes, more the way, especially in production, it makes total sense to me in production, stuff that classes and, and education you're giving that's not theory, that's, that's really do, do, do. Um, tell me well, more about your philosophy on that. Well, I call my approach like a theopractical approach. I mean, I do use a lot of theory, but it's ha hands-on theory. Um, I think that, yes, I do see myself as an, as, as an athletic coach. Day one, I have a class of, let's say, 12 students. Um, contrary to popular myth, filmmaking is highly collaborative. And as mm -hmm. a director, you have to know how to collaborate, um, in, in, in my opinion. So what I really, really do try to emphasize from day one is to create strong bonds between the students. Um, ideally, they like each other, but even if they don't, it also teaches them to overcome the conflicts and to learn how to work with people that maybe they don't want to work with. And we don't get to choose who we work with all the time in the industry. So I have found, um, you know, over the, gosh, 18 years I've been teaching now, um, that the classes that always make the best films are the classes that, are, that have the strongest bonds. Mm. I, I've never seen it any other way. Uh, so. And I know that, you know, a set, it's like, it is, it's like you have to, it's teamwork in order to, to be efficient. So it is something that I do absolutely incorporate into my teaching because they have to learn this too, you know? And another thing that I struggle with, I, I can't speak for other teachers, is, you know, where do you find that balance between creating students who perfectly fit into the industry versus creating students who can also change the industry? And that's a difficult one. That's a difficult one to, to, to strike. Um, Film school is a place to explore. Film school is a place for the students to find out who they are as human beings and as artists and to take risks. And I encourage that because you can't do that in the real world, in the commercial world, when there's money at stake, right? So that's you really important. It's not to your money. What's that? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's not your, you can do it if it's your money. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, and how do you, <laughs> How do you like what do you know? I'm sure you after doing it for 18 years. What is your way of like say you took a concert? How do you get a conservative student to start taking risks? Good question. <clears throat> um, I had an interesting experience uh, two years ago. A student came up to me at graduation and he said, I didn't like you at first, 
I said, really? How come? And he said, well, because you pushed me out of my comfort zone. And I said, well, I guess I did my job then. And he said, yeah, it was really hard for me. It made me feel uncomfortable. I, I mean, creative comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, yeah, it was really difficult. I said, but did you learn? And he said, yeah, now I realize why you did it. And I really want to thank you because had you not done that and had you not pushed me, he said, I never would have discovered who I was as a filmmaker. That's beautiful. So, That's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, and do you, um, and back to the collaboration, how do you encourage the collaboration? Because I find that that's challenging with any team. Um, I, well, I, I certainly encourage them to all hang out and get to know each other. Um, and depending upon how that goes, you know, sometimes I might even throw, I, uh, I, sometimes I'll do like um, group exercises, survival exercises um, and things like that to, you know, create a problem and have them all, they have to all work together. It has nothing on the surface to do with film but it has everything to do with film underneath the surface. So uh, that's, that's some of the things that I do. Um, and, um, you know, and then of course, when we're, when we're on set, actually in production workshops, um, I'm also encouraging that, uh, the relationships and so on and so forth. Um, you know, um, I also, um, you know, I, I, a lot of people have told me my method is more of a so, kind of a Socratic method as well. Um, I'm not a lecturer. Uh, of course, I have to lecture, but I'm not going to lecture for three hours. I mean, uh, this is filmmaking. It's proactive. So I want to engage the students. So I'm always asking questions, always, always getting them involved. So their minds are active as well, right? Mm -hmm. if I'm just lecturing. They're like, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> um, that's not to say, you know, yeah, so I, I am very conscious of that. You know, very proactive, very proactive. Um, so that's great. Um, so I'm going to go to. There's a couple questions here. Thank you, audience. Um, John V. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name wrong. What is the most important thing a filmmaker has to keep in mind? Ooh, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I think that as a filmmaker you have to be you have to be true to your vision which is not which is not an easy thing to do and i think you have to know you have to know who you are as a filmmaker and the story you want to tell and how you want to tell it um and that of course gets more complicated in the commercial world um for many different reasons but i think that's remaining true to yourself um and your vision and standing up for your vision in a respectful and nice way and, and sometimes, though, I find that you don't, you have your vision, but it's also the work starts to need to talk to you as well. It's oh, like sure. not, not just grasping on with like death grip to this vision that may want to transform as oh, sure. you're making. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, things always, especially when you're making docs, things always change. But, but you have to, I think you have to have that, um, that strong foundation. So once you have that foundation and that knowledge of what you are trying to achieve, then you can fly. Then you're, poof, I mean, it's Superman, <laughs> you know, exactly. but if you don't, yeah, you don't have that foundation, then it starts to cr crumble underneath you and then you fall <laughs> and then you can't fly. So. And, Sorry, um, <laughs> we won't get depressed. Scarlett asks, why did you choose film as a medium for telling stories over other types of mediums? Good question. Um, I, was a, I was a straight A student growing up. I was interested in everything. Um, I'm one of those people that loves education. I love to learn. And film was perfect for me because everything I've ever learned applies to filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is it. Well, why don't what you know? This this is perfect for me. Now, I also, you know, when I was at Tufts University, for some reason, I woke up one day and said, "Hey, I want to I want to go to a TV station." So I went to a public access TV station in Linsox, and they said, "All right, we're doing the news. Your camera three. What? I don't know how to use a camera. It's easy. Yeah, you hold the handles, and that's the focus, and that's the that's the zoom, and you got the headphones, and they'll tell you what to do." And, you know, I realized right away it was easy for me. My mom's an artist, um, so I grew up with visuals. Uh, and right away, I just, it, it just felt 
natural to me. Um, um, so it, it's a combination of that. And then, um, yeah, I think it just incorporates everything that I love. Uh, this is why I like making docs because you make a document. I'm an expert on Summer Hill School now. Um, you know, you really learn about your subject matters and I just, oh, I love that. So that's really, for me, that's really my goal. And also, you know, as you were saying earlier, yeah, I learn about myself um, making, making films. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. That's great. Um, Justice asks, in your eyes, how would you describe a good filmmaker slash director? Oosh, that's a good question. And of course that can be highly subjective. Mm -hmm. um, I think a good filmmaker has a strong vision and knows how to to realize it. I think um, a good director, and this is, this is my personal belief, I think a film director has to know how to direct actors and really well. Um, you know, um, so that's, that's what I would say. Now there are many directors who don't, um, but I believe a director should be the visual storyteller and also direct the actors. Um, so that's what I would say a good director, in my opinion, can do all the above. But has and, that strong, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and as we were talking about, you know, it is part of that being the coach is part of, you know, that mindset is helpful as opposed to, let's say, the dictator, which is not very helpful. I, it's never been my style. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, maybe I'm dictatorial <laughs> when I push people, you know, but that's no, no. I, I you know, I, one of the first things I say in class is, don't call me sir. Don't call me Mr. Smith. Don't call me Professor. My name is Billy. And that's what I want you to call me. You know, I believe in squashing the hierarchy. Yeah, of course I'm the teacher. Yes, of course I have more knowledge, but that doesn't mean I'm higher. It doesn't mean I'm better. And I don't want my students to be afraid of me. Mm -hmm. Quite the contrary. Um, I don't want to teach through fear. I want to teach through positivity and connections. So. And have you seen, um, you know, it reminds me that the, there's so many, thankfully, more and more women entering into the industry. Um, how do you, like, say, give people that are more afraid, if I'm afraid of the technical or afraid of things, how do you give them confidence? Um, I think, well, I think that's an issue of just, of just, of, of doing it and being on set and um, you know some students you do have to give a little bit more uh, attention to and you know you, you kind of have to be a psychologist I think in, in a lot of ways when you're a teacher uh, and you have to be very aware of the differences between your students because different students need you know they need everyone learns differently uh, mm -hmm. you have to be sensitive to that even though I have a general overall method uh, you do have to be, you do have to adapt the same way when you direct actors, not all actors work the same, you know, so you have to be aware of that as a director. It's not easy, not easy. Oh. This, is, this is funny. Rob Moreland. Hi, Billy. Hey, Rob. You're, oh, my God. Hey, Rob. MFA Film oh. School Classic. Rob here. I shot Rob's film. I was camera operator. I wasn't the DP. I was camera operator on it. Hey, Rob. <laughs> Rob, Rob has some questions for you, Billy, okay. though. Right. How about the lessons you learned at film school? What were one or two of the most important things you, capital Y-O-U, learned, for instance, from our guru teacher, Jersey, I can't pronounce it, Ansi? Jersey yeah. Anchak. Or Guy um, something. Okay. Yeah, Rob and I took <laughs> an- Eastern European cadre that taught you. Yes, we had a lot of Eastern European teachers at UCLA. Uh, Rob and I were fortunate to take the best course I ever took. And it was a year long course with a Polish director named Jerzy Anczak. He was nominated for an Oscar, Nights and Days, I think in 77, 78. Amazing man. And we had to make, um, we had to make 20 minute films, one shot. Dolly. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. And there were 15 of us in the class. It was absolutely the most talented bunch of people I've ever worked with in my life. And I still think about that class and the, the, the talent and how much, how much I learned about filmmaking. I mean, you know, you, if, to, 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 come, to, to create a 20 minute one shot film with different shot sizes, right? Um, 
I felt like when I took that course, I'm a filmmaker now. That's how I felt. It was a year long course and it ended in final in a film. You know, well, tell us his approach because obviously it's not even just the shot, it's the moments it's creating a whole arc. Oh yeah, it, it was amazing, amazing. And I think Rob would agree. <laughs> Hello, Rob again. Uh, but yours was a major, major, major inspiration. Another teacher, Jula Gazdag, Hungarian, uh, Mel Schreiben as well, American. Um, the te the, I had a really good experience at UCLA. I really did. Um, so. And so, so that obviously instilled your love of craft and, and of the story embedded in, you know, it's using the camera and how to use the camera in a I intelligent manner to tell a story and was it with dialogue yeah the dialogue oh yeah absolutely yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's all, it all about visual rhythms and emotional rhythms and subtextual rhythm and it was great it was great it was I, I, you know when we took that course you felt like wow we're we're the french new way we're we're in europe you know europe in the in the 50s um i mean that was that was years yeah, that's that was his generation um, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful to have studied with someone um, from from the from the new wave, so to speak, you know, from Poland in this case. But um, amazing Eastern European filmmaking uh, under the Soviet rule was actually amazing. That's one of the sad things. It's it's kind of not the same as it used to be. Um, so yeah. Um. Well, do you see, because, is it because in that way there was hardships they had to overcome so the, the stories were more intense or, or, or what were you, when you... Um, oh, you mean in Eastern Europe? Well, my, uh, uh, another one of my professors, Jula Gazdag, uh, he made a film called Hungarian Fairy Tale. That's his most famous film. He talked about how it was a lot of fun uh, in Hungary and you know, in the Soviet bloc because, you know, they had censorship, but... Mm -hmm. um, Oh, most of the films that were made were anti-Soviet films, but they were like allegories or there's symbolism in them. And he said that that was, that was the fun, that we would create these films that even, even the censors knew, but it wasn't explicit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but, but people talk about that with the Hollywood production code as well, that in some respects, there's some positivity when you, when, you know, when you handcuff an artist, so to speak, they're still gonna communicate what you don't want them to communicate, but they have to find more uh, creative, more interesting ways, perhaps. So there's an argument that you have to be more creative, right? And that totally is. When I was uh, working in China, like two years ago, that was, and I did some master classes. the question would be, well, how do we get past censorship, you know, as Chinese oh, filmmakers? And I said, be more creative. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, and I, look, I'm 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 a visual storyteller. Um, I love symbolism and metaphors, and I'm really really push that you know the visual storytelling show rather than tell. Right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Shivam asks a great question: If you had the opportunity to remake a classic, which one or which ones would you go for? Wow, Sunset Boulevard. I think would be one of them. I think, well, not because it's a bad movie. Is this question like just because I would want to make it or because uh, Modern Times? I would love to do a film like Modern Times. Um, I, Wings of Desire, I would love to direct a film like that. Um, so I wouldn't do Psycho though. <laughs> um, no, there's, there's, a, there's enough, that was blood and gore now, you know, that, I don't, don't know. need yeah. that. That'd be challenging. Yeah. Make it modern and interesting. Yeah. I'd like to redo my, my feature film, actually, but that's another story. <laughs> Talk about that another time. <laughs> um, and, and Anon asks, filmmaking is highly collaborative. How do you cope with crews who don't have the same taste or vision as you? Besides not hiring them. but. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I think it, that shouldn't really matter. And I, and I think part of the, you know, you, you try to work with crew that you're going to get along with. It doesn't really matter if they have a different taste. If you mean working with a DP who doesn't agree with your vision, then I don't know why you're working with that DP. Um, you want to work with people who are on the same creative level as you. Now, if that's not possible, um, you just have to be very clear and I think and concise in your communication. 
Yeah, that's how I would answer that. Um, right, and 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 be willing to hear other points of view is I'm also sure. sure. You, know, you never know. Everybody has some gem inside them. Sure. I mean, look, being being a director, I, I would say to my students, you're a sponge. Mm -hmm. Meaning you know, all points of view are valid and, and you maybe you can be working with someone and you disagree completely on the kind of films that you like, but maybe that person has some idea or some suggestion and you're like, and, and you're thinking, you know what, that's really it. that could really work in the film. So I think you have to be you have to be open minded, but you know, malleable, but also stubborn as well. But st stubborn malleable? Is that a concept? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think you you know yeah. That's. Um, Michael asks, how do you feel what's going on in the world today? COVID, Black Lives Matter, climate change going to affect filmmaking? Oh, that's a big question. Um, well, it's obviously affecting production and how we shoot films. Um, now, if you if you if you mean post COVID. Um, well, okay, I, I, I think in terms of what's going on today, I think it will impact film. I think film will become, in terms of who's making films, I think there will be more diversity. I think there will be more points of view, more, more different kinds of stories being told that I think reflect more um, the melting pot of the United States. Um, so I think, I, I, I think it's gonna be a lot of positive changes uh, in, in, in the film industry. You know, I always say to people and be, you know, cause I, I, I know, you know, I taught in India and I know a lot of Indian filmmakers actually. The future of Indian filmmaking, it's not the future, it's right now. It's female filmmakers. Shona Lee, are you out there? Shona Lee Bose? She's one of them who's leading. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's how I would respond to that question. I don't know if I've answered it satisfactorily, but. Well, I think it's, you know, in a global pandemic can't but affect, it's affecting every human on the planet. So it's going sure. to affect the film business. Sure. We don't even know yet. Yeah. And there are really great stories that are going to come out. There are going to be derivative stories about person dies of COVID. Oh, well, didn't we just live that? But yeah. there will be some probably amazing, emotional, interesting things that come out of the whole. Um, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to get to the point where I think we're, oh my God, another COVID movie. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I think you're right. A lot of interesting stories. I could see, I wish Robert Altman were still alive. Um, I'd love to see a shortcut style movie, you know, um, made about the COVID situation, you know, around the world, cutting between different stories and vignettes. You could steal that idea, anyone, if you like. Um, it's not a film I'm going to so that's, feel free. <laughs> that's for free. But yeah, I mean, but it leaves, but it leaves everyone, you know, there's lots of different opportunities and just like uh, the Holocaust, there's a million Holocaust films, there's a million sure. documents still being made, you know, there's never an endless supply of stories that are come, come from that era. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll have that as well with COVID and, and points yeah. of view. And I think with the different points of view, when this starts happening more, then, then it changes the audience as well, right? And then the audience starts to expect more points of view because they're more used to it, right? So I, I think long term, it's, it's very positive, very positive. Exactly. Well, Billy, tell us how can we find you? If I want to like either look at your Instagram or reach out to you somehow, how can I find you? Uh, I have a website. It's williamtylersmith.com. Um, I also have two other websites, thirdmindblues.com and then groovysmovie.com. Um, but if you just go to my website, it, it has the links to the other websites. Uh, I talk about my still photography, my filmmaking. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff on my website, actually. So, yeah. um, I just want to thank you. And I feel really honored to have done this. And I don't know who's out there. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Um, and hey, <laughs> Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, Bill. You've been an amazing guest, and we're so excited to see your next work that you have come out, and all the lucky students that are going to be actually able to um, be educated by you. And thank you, New York Film Academy, for.
being a wonderful presenter of this amazing series. And everybody be safe and healthy. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.